we're coming up with what, to me, as I said, is a is quite a an exciting talk from Zen Energy. The person who's giving the talk is uh, Richard Turner. He is the founder and director of Innovation at Zen Energy, and I have to apologise to him. I think I called him the CEO for his one time occupied that role. <coughs> does no longer. 12 years ago. 12 years ago, <laughs> but he, he's the guy who started it. Right? So Richard founded the multi-award winning Zen Energy Systems in 2004 and was awarded the 2010 Ernst & Young Australian Entrepreneur of the Year for, clean tech sector, for the clean tech sector. Richard graduated from the University of South Australia in 84 with a Bachelor of Business in Marketing and has founded four successful companies across four completely different industry sectors. I suppose we can consider him as uh, South Australia's Elon Musk. Zen has been noted as the fastest growing company in South Australia for two consecutive years and the fourth fastest growing company in Australia and is now a world leader in intelligent distributed energy solutions. Richard's first business was Regency Food Services founded with his brother Greg in 87. This business was sold to Bidvest in 99 and the model used for their national rollout is now a $1 billion revenue business in Australia. That's pretty impressive. Richard also founded the South Australian chapter of the Global Entrepreneurs Organisation, BO, in 1998 and continues to be an active member. You may be aware that Sanjeev Gupta has now acquired a controlling interest in Zen Energy and is working with Richard to make Zen one of the most important players in the Australian renewable energy market and in fact once you hear this talk you will realise it's the most important innovation in the world. Nowhere else on the globe will you hear this story. Well, I'm very proud to introduce Richard Turner of Zen Energy to tell us all what the future of our energy market looks like in South Australia. Richard Turner ladies and gentlemen. I was actually CEO for the first 12 years, but I gave that away a couple of years ago. And CEOs, as most of you may know, is a very administrative role, and, and I enjoy having the, uh, the fun and doing the innovation stuff, and, and uh, yeah, I'm in a role that I enjoy now. So I, look, I hope tonight I can open your eyes a bit to what is really a fundamental shift that's going on in the energy sector. Uh, I'll open with a disclaimer that I'm not an engineer, and I know this is an engineer's uh, dinner. Uh, I'm my back background's in business, but as a young kid, I really did enjoy maths and physics at school. And, um, and I think going into business and into this sector without being an engineer, I don't have the, the issues of knowing the rules and the boundaries, and, and I ask the questions of the establishment of why can't we do this, why can't we do that? And we've been on a journey for the last 14 years of bringing people together that can really affect fundamental change in this industry. And, uh, and I think it's more than fundamental change now, I think we're actually rocking the very foundations of this industry. So you, you'll see what that's all about. So um, I've got this in front of me so I can sort of stand talking to you. So we've got to make sure we sync the slides up if we've got that one on. I thought we'd start with, with some of the stuff you've seen in the papers. And, uh, and I love the picture on the left here with Elon Musk and Sanjeev Gupta. I see a very contented Sanjeev Gupta there with his, uh, he's got the biggest battery. So you know, you know what they say, he's got the biggest battery wins. And, um, and our investment that was announced last year with the Wayala Steelworks. So we're spending a, a billion dollars or so on the Wayala Steelworks and, uh, and a billion dollars on the energy supply. now. The fundamental model that we're deploying, and this is Sanjeev's model around the world, is own the energy consumption. If you own the energy consumption, you can then build out the power generation and you start controlling the market. So there's a fundamental business strategy that you'll see emerge through this. This picture with the French President Macron about three weeks ago just happened to coincide when we signed the deal with the French company Neowen in Australia. So. Um, perfect timing. Uh, it was the lowest cost power offtake agreement in history in this country with solar energy and, uh, and perfect that we had Temple and Macron there at, at the signing to witness it. We've just last week also, you'll see the media signed two more power offtake agreements with Wersol, or Wersol, the German company, 
uh, again, lowest cost power takeoff um, in the history of Australia. So we've now sort of stuck our flag in three of the biggest solar farms in the country and, and more to come. And um, But our ultimate goal is to build out our own power generation, which we've got underway now. In fact, we start turning dirt on the, the biggest solar farm in the country, which will be our own, um, in um, Wyala next month, as well as the big battery project, which is a 120 megawatt battery, as well as by the end of this year, hopefully our first pumped hydro project in Australia, which is in the middle back ranges in, um, in uh, near Wyala. So a bit about Zen. So where are we now? We're probably one of the largest or the largest renewable energy company in Australia. We still do our residential and commercial solar and storage, but we now have an energy developments division, which is building the very large scale projects. And that produces our energy pool for our other division, which is our energy markets division now that is actually retailing that power out to industrial consumers. So our model is, own the biggest consumers in the country, build out power stations to service our own demand, and then build out excess power generation to supply and leverage that scale to supply the next tier of industrials so they get the benefit of what we're doing, and then eventually work down the scale. So by the end of this year, we should have a commercial electricity product available for businesses. Probably won't get into the domestic market in the near term, but we may enter through the community energy model. So. Towns like Port Augusta, Wyala, Port Perry, where we've got enormous scale of generation on their doorstep, it would make sense to go and supply those towns with their energy. So that's probably where we will enter the residential market. Um, but largely, we we're, were accredited back in the early days. We started this company in 2004, um, you know, accredited for pioneering, I guess, the modern solar industry. We ran a lot of very large community energy programs back in the early days. Um, in fact, in South Australia, we had 38 councils working simultaneously on deploying solar energy systems um, and sort of made a name for ourselves in that space. And, and we've won, won a lot of awards uh, along the way. So the history was back in 2004. Some of you may have heard me speak before. Um, it really started off, like all great companies do, off the dining room table and in our case off the, or from inside the kids' cubby house. And um, the story there really was one night, we were playing with the kids late at night and they wanted a little light on the television in their cubby house and there was no power at the back of the yard. So I said, well, in the car, we'll go down to the hobby shop. And this is before there was any solar industry and we bought a little solar panel and an inverter and a battery and, a, um, and some switch gear. And we set this little system up in the cubby house and it worked and we thought, this is fun. And I stood back and I thought, well, there's no system there's no brand, there's no kit there, and there's no barriers, technical barriers, to actually scaling this up to run a whole house. And I thought, well, we're just starting to see the first stories in the newspaper about climate change. John Howard, the Prime Minister of the time, was just starting to talk about incentives to reduce the demand for power. And I thought, well, okay, let's, let's actually look at the idea of setting up a home energy system. We, we looked at, my father-in-law was a senior electrician, we looked around the world and found SMA, a German company that just come out of the rail industry, just started building their first home inverters, solar inverters. We found a Chinese company called ET Solar, just had one manual production line. We got these companies talking together and uh, I said, look, we've, we've got this brand called Zen. Can you, can you match your components and let's launch a product called the Zen Home Energy System? So we sort of demystified the technology. We launched the system on the market that could power from a quarter of the average home to all of the average home. You know, people didn't understand solar energy, so we just sort of took that responsibility away from the consumer. We said, here's the Zen Home Energy System, and you can choose what size you want. It's just a matter of how big you want it. And the public loved that, and the business took off. And, uh, and as John said, by 2010 or 12, I think the, the 2012 BRW wrote us up as the fourth fastest growing company in the country. But very quickly, I worked out that we wanted to do some fundamental shifts in how the energy sector worked. And that wasn't something I could do. My skill set is sort of this big. What we were trying to change was the Titanic. You know, it was it was a very, very complex sector. We needed some very key people and technologies in this organization if we were gonna go forward and affect that sort of change. Um, in 2010, the, the first bit of that jigsaw puzzle came together. When we won the Australian Entrepreneur of the Year competition, the 
the chair of the judging panel that year in Sydney was a guy called Raymond Spencer, who some of you may know, he's the current chair of our state's economic development board. Very interesting guy himself, came from Clarendon, um, went to India as a young lad, did a, a lot of not-for-profit work in economic development in India, then started up his own company in IT financial services, grew it into a bit of a global monster, headquartered in Chicago, listed it on the NASDAQ, and sold it eventually to Capgemini out of Europe for about $2 billion. So he did very well for himself, but he loves renewable energy. He wanted to bring his family back to Adelaide, which he did. As the chair of the judging panel, got to see our company very closely and the, the inner workings and rang me up after the competition and said, can we go and have a glass of wine? Uh, said, I think you've got the model right for renewable energy in this country. Is there room for me to go on that journey with you? And it was just at the time we needed to set up our first board and our first governance. And I said, Raymond, it's like that Alan Bond moment, you know, please, we'd love to have you on board uh, and, and we'd love to have you as our chairman. So Raymond came on board and invested. But the key thing Raymond brought to the company that we were looking for was he was also an early founder of two key technology companies in the US. One was a company called Virtue Stream, which was a pioneer cloud computing company. So if you think of the software architecture in that, it's around distributed computing. The other company that he was an early founder of was a company called Greensmith Energy Management Systems. Now Greensmith, owned by the same directors, pioneered the software architecture around controlling distributed energy storage in the grid and developed the first control systems for lithium ion batteries. Uh, hence energy storage and we said well we this is the key fundamental technology we need in our business in Australia so when Raymond joined in 2010 we brought that Greensmith control system and their technology into Australia now 2010 <coughs> eight years ago that really positioned our company as the national leader in the energy storage space which was a which was a key thing for us um, if, if you look at Greensmith and you may not know Greensmith just to get an understanding of their position in the market. In the US last year, they did 60 grid scale battery installations. Tesla did one. And actually didn't, didn't do it that well, to be honest. So um, you know, they're, they're a, a phenomenal business in terms of they own like 35% of the market share in the US. Uh, so interesting, interesting business. Roll forward to 2015. So during that period, we're looking at introducing grid scale batteries into the market here in Australia. And we very quickly learned that we needed to do more. You can't just introduce new technology. The market is governed by rules and regulations, and it was all geared towards old technology, old generators, and, and the retailers had learned very nicely how to manipulate the markets using old technology and also exploiting the existing market rules. So we had to change those market rules, and no one person really, especially myself, was able to do that. So, Ross Garno, Professor Ross Garno, some of you may know, Ross is our preeminent economics professor in Australia, uh, out of the, based at the Melbourne uh, University. But most importantly, he was engaged by the, uh, the federal government to do the 2008 to 2011 Garno review on how we prepare our energy sector to move forward and potentially transition to a low carbon economy. So Ross was charged with that responsibility. He learnt the energy sector inside out. He created agencies like ARENA, the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. He instigated our first carbon pricing mechanism. I mean, what he didn't know about the energy sector, you didn't need to know. But he was fundamentally the architect for our transition to a low carbon economy. But Ross being Ross, didn't want to just be the architect. He wanted to be part of the change. So he went looking for a company or an entity that he could join to make that happen for himself. He found our company, he said, you've got the technology, you've got the people, is there room for me to go on that journey with you? And we said, of course, Ross, we need your skills, we need to influence the market rules, and we need to make changes, specific changes, to, to be able to make batteries pay for themselves, to be able to introduce, introduce solar, and to be able to make this whole renewable sector work. So we brought Ross's consulting company and merged it into Zen back in 2015. Ross became our chairman because he had the, the national profile and Raymond stepped, as, well, stepped aside to become deputy chairman and we were creating this, this amazing board of 
people and uh, we're starting to, to attract some incredible talent out of the sector, moving to Zen to be part of this change. Um, then we work forward. Part of the work we did with the, the new team was develop a energy plan for Arium. Now, as you know, Arium was really struggling. This is the Steelworks uh, and their associated businesses around the country. Uh, we sat down with our guys and developed an energy plan that was all about deploying new low-cost clean energy generation around the Iron Triangle, particularly to feed the Steelworks. Now, Arium, as you know, went into administration, never got to deploy that plan as the old Arium. So the state government then had the business up for sale, uh, working with Corner Metford, the receivers. The, uh, the initial acquirers or favoured acquirers of Arium was a Taiwanese group, so they came in. And then the Gupta family came in from the UK. Now Sanjeev Gupta he is Indian born, but educated at Cambridge University in the UK. Very clever guy. Uh, he had already at that point revived British steel and British aluminium, which he owned. He actually developed the Liberty business while he was an undergraduate at Cambridge. Uh, quite a remarkable story. But his whole model for reviving that business in the UK was around developing clean energy generation assets. So he bought Green Highlands Energy in the UK, which is the biggest hydro energy company over there. Uh, he also bought Atlantis Resources, or 50% of Atlantis Resources, which is the biggest wave and tidal company in the UK. So rolling out currently gigawatts of wave and tidal generation around Scotland and Ireland and Wales. Um, and also had big batteries and wind. That combination of energy saved them about 30% on their energy costs and saved British steel and British aluminium, not just saved them, rebuilt that entire business. So he came to Australia with that model in his back pocket, looked at Arium, went into the data room as you do when you acquire a business, saw our energy plan in there and said, this is exactly what we've done in the UK. Uh, and when you add solar energy into that mix of renewable sources, we'll save about 50% on our energy costs in Australia and we'll make this business globally competitive. And he said, well, there's no no point in reinventing the wheel. Again, you've got the people, you've got the technologies. Um, how about we bring our companies together and, and we'll go 50-50. In fact, he bought 50.1%, so a controlling share, and now we're technically Simec Zen Energy. So I'll take you through the branding model soon. But um, you get an offer like that and you say, <coughs> Yes, Mr. Gupta, we're in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't have to think too long about that one. Um, so that's 2017. So um, a bit about the, the GFG business. Um, very interesting business, and we're still learning the inner workings of it all. But um, there's five business pillars. There's the Liberty business, which most of you would know. It's the steel works, the, re, the steel recycling, the aluminium smelters, all the heavy industry. Um, the consumer of energy fits under the Liberty banner. Simec, and you can see here we've got a, a few brands, and we're, we're actually about to go through a global brand workshop to sort of re, re look at the brands and how we can simplify it now. So, Simec is a, an acronym for uh, Shipping, Infrastructure, Mining, Energy, and I forget what the C stands for, but um, uh, it's the Energy and Natural Resources business. Now, we fall <coughs> under that division, so that's why they're now called Simec Zen. Wylands, um, is his bank. In the UK he owns his own bank and that's been very handy for us having our own bank <laughs> in this business particularly. Uh, and he's about to launch the Wildlands Bank in Australia. It's the fastest growing bank in the UK. It's targeted at the mid-tier financial sector with businesses with revenues of 50 to 500 million. His theory is that sector is very underserviced. The residential sector serviced very well. The corporates are serviced very well. That mid-tier sector is not serviced very well and uh, he's found a real niche. Jahama is the property ownership and management group um, in the UK. They're now the fifth largest private landholder in the UK. Uh, incredible group that is now acquiring all the land assets around Australia as well. And the GFG Foundation, who were here last week talking to uh, UniSA and Adelaide Uni, and very relevant to your group, as we develop an abundance of low cost energy, and we'll talk about all the spin off industries that are, going, that are going to start here and the rejuvenation of existing heavy industries, we are going to have a huge shortage of demand, in demand, for, or, sorry, not shortage of demand, um, shortage of engineers. Um, so the GFG Foundation is all about bridging the skills gap 
of students coming through school. They have three stages of targeting students, you know, around the year nine, year 10 stage, then the end of school, and then in university. But it's about grabbing those kids through a cadets program that's now endorsed, actually Prince Charles is now the ambassador of the GFG Foundation. But it's about bridging that skills gap between kids leaving school and university, going into those engineering and STEM subjects and getting that workforce available for us. Uh, John, this next one. So just quickly in a bit of a snapshot, so you can see the GFG Foundation, there's about 20,000 employees uh, globally now, about 200 global locations, 30 countries servicing 60 countries, um, about 10 million tonnes of, God, my eyes are getting bad, <laughs> still, uh, still um, traded every year by the GFG Alliance. Uh, you can see it's a massive business and even every three seconds there's a plane lands with an undercarriage that's made of steel from our factories. Every eight seconds a car's produced with components out of our factory. In fact in the UK the GFG Alliance is the biggest car component manufacturer in the UK and now in India. So when Sanjeev says we're absolutely building electric cars in Australia, we are going to be building cars in Australia. So that's going to be happening very soon. The vision for steel, so again looking at the consuming business of energy, he says that we have, since the industrial revolution, there is so much steel in the built form out there already, our future business won't be so much about producing new steel, it'll be about recycling the existing steel that's out there. And we can do that, it's very heavy, heavily inten uh, energy intensive, and we can do that much cheaper through clean energy, hence green steel. This is our board back in October last year. So Ross Garno, Sanjeev, uh, Raymond on the left there, Jeff Titus, our current CEO, uh, Michael Morley. We have also have Jay Hambro. Michael and Jay are probably the two of the world's leading industrialists on our board with Sanjeev. We have this incredible dream team as a board. We have a lot of the senior management from AGL have now joined Zen. A lot of senior management from other retailers, from other distribution companies have now joined Zen. We've sort of gone to that tipping point where the people who want to be a part of the future and the clean energy future are now coming to us. So it's a very proud moment to sort of get to that tipping point. But that's the list of the, the projects we're currently working on in South Australia. Sanjeev's already made the announcement that we're building a gigawatt of power gener or solar generation in South Australia, but we're now looking at 10 gigawatts of solar generation across the country, which is just massive. There's a 90 megawatt, 390 megawatt hour pumped hydro facility that we're putting into the Iron Duchess mine site just southwest of Blyalla. The so pumped hydro is where you have a high and a low dam. During peak times you run the water downhill, produce an enormous amount of energy, and then during uh, times of the day and night when you have abundant excess power from solar and wind, you run it in, you divert it into these uh, turbines, you put them into reverse, pump the water back up the hill. So it's a method of energy storage and generation. Uh, the lithium-ion battery is going into Port Augusta, I think very significantly going into the old Port Augusta power station. So uh, it's, uh, it's there. Um, it will be 20% larger than the current Tesla battery. And, uh, and that's just coincident. It just happened to be the size of the battery we needed for the steelworks. So it wasn't about outdoing Elon's battery. Um, and the 100 megawatts of cogeneration too, just extracting the heat from the steelworks and producing power from that. So. That's fundamentally the mix of the gigawatt that's going into, or gigawatt plus that's going into South Australia. Um, but there's a lot more going across the country. I thought just to inspire you, and a bit about what I'm talking about in the business model that Sanjeev is deploying around the world. We've talked about British steel and British aluminium. He's just bought the biggest steel mill in Dunkirk in Europe, so the Europe's biggest steel mill. He's bought one of the biggest steel mills in India. Every one of these is being powered by renewable energy. That is his model. Okay, this is from Tuesday this week. Uh, he bought the Georgetown Steelworks, one of the biggest steelworks in the US. And I'll read you this out because you probably can't read this from the back of the room. But it says in the ceremony in front of local dignitaries, customers, employees, union officials, and group executives, today the historic Georgetown Steelworks in South Carolina was formally restarted by our executive chairman Sanjeev Gupta. This marked a key milestone for Liberty Steel in the USA and was the first step towards restoring full production to the 750,000 tonne a year plant. He also said the recommissioning of Georgetown's furnaces and wire rod mills would be the first in a series of GFG projects across the US and Canada, 
amounting to more than $5 billion in investments over the next few years. Of this, $1 billion is expected to be invested during the coming year to acquire and develop steel, aluminium, engineering, mining, energy generation, and financial service assets. So the bank, the energy companies, they're all going to land in the US. They're going to buy the, buy the demand for energy first and then apply the other services around it. The group is also establishing a New York regional head office as a hub for its global business in the US. So you can see it's, it, it is a model that's being deployed globally. For us here, it enables us to enter the market as a new electricity retailer. So we've been used to this oligopoly of AGL and Origin. They don't own demand, we do. It's a very different business model. The traditional models of contracting power for a year, two years, three years in the commercial business, that model will change quite significantly because we're building out new power generation. So we build the generation for our own businesses, then we build out the excess generation to fit other businesses. So you might have read last week, we, we now supply Foodland supermarkets with all their power, by Terra, the Grains Company, the Central Irrigation Trust, uh, and a number of other significant businesses in South Australia. But the way the future will work is that we'll build out a diverse mix of power generation of solar, wind, battery, solar thermal, hydro, to exactly, mix, to exactly meet how these businesses use their power. So depending on how you use power day and night, we'll build the generation out to exactly fit that, and that's how you will get the lowest cost of power in the future. So for Foodland, for instance, we basically halved their energy, probably more than half their energy cost overnight with clean energy. So um, yeah, big, big shift in the market, big shift fundamentally in how people think about contracting energy. Um, the offer is a fact, as I said, by new renewable energy investment contributing to additional supply in the market that we then use to supply others and drive down prices. So um, the other thing that we do, because we still do solar and batteries, what we call behind the meter, so in your business or at home you put solar and batteries in, when you do that, you actually reduce your demand for power, so you're not paying for the poles and wires in the street. So your cheapest power is always what you put on your, on your roof, so we're sort of evolving like a mobile phone company where you get your handset and your data plan. Going into the future, you'll virtually get your hardware, being your solar and your battery, behind the meter, and you'll get your complementary electricity plan that will be designed to fit in together. Okay, um, our first customer, great customer to have, South Australian State Government. Uh, so we now are contracting all the load to the South Australian State Government and the other big deal we did last week was actually for SACOP, the South Australian Chamber of Mines and Energy. So they had a buying group they put together for all these large businesses. And it was, I think, significantly, it was the first time a tender had gone out to put old energy against new energy. And we won hands down. So that's the, a sign of where things are going. Uh, you'll see there's a lot of talk going on about community energy. Um, community energy takes many forms and we're still nailing down the model of what community energy will look like. Uh, it could be microgrids like this, where you have self-contained circular economies. Most likely they'll be connected to the main grid, so they won't be off-grid or independent of the main grid. And people get very confused about being off-grid or grid independent. They're quite different things. Um, but it allows communities, and I said look, Port Perry is, is a typical example of a town that's gone out, the count, local government, the council's gone out looking for a community energy program, and John and I were having that conversation yesterday, a lot of these future community programs will be driven by local government looking to work for their community, and they could be potentially uh, the community energy retailer, or work with us to develop those sorts of models. New local distribution models can be developed for power, uh, local generation like this sort of thing, where you've got local generation, local batteries, local wind, local solar, can produce the energy far cheaper than what it can be taken from traditional sources. So you're gonna see a lot more of this type of stuff emerge. Uh, next <coughs> Behind the meter, as I said, is always still gonna be a key part. Microgrids behind the meter is gonna be fundamental. It's all about balancing behind the meter with what you need. So. Um, we're doing a lot of, and this is how fast this industry has changed. You know, a, a big commercial solar installation two years ago was 30 kilowatts. Now we're doing 
multi-megawatt rooftop installations. Um, the cost of power is so cheap. You know, you're looking at two to three cents a kilowatt hour for power produced on the rooftop behind the meter over the life of the system. Over 10 years, it might be five or six cents a kilowatt hour, but it's cheaper than you'll ever buy in. So people now need to put on as much as they can behind the meter. We're working with a lot of the big shopping centers in town. As I said, that was Bigfords, we've got Sealy International, we've got Arms Engineering, they've all done multi megawatts on their rooftop, but it's just very cheap power. Home batteries, commercial batteries, um, all going in. This is the opportunity that we see for South Australia. And this is from Ross Garner, who I said is our preeminent economics professor in the country. So he's been working on this for years. This mentality has come out of his Garner review with the, the federal government. But where South Australia didn't do very well under the old fossil fuel economy, our coal was dirty brown coal from Lee Creek. It was like trying to burn mud and bringing it down from Lee Creek to Port Augusta is a long haul. It's expensive. We're on the end of the eastern electricity grid. It's a long spindly grid. We incurred the worst of the costs. We just did not have anything going for us under the old fossil fuel regime. Uh, we had the lowest and least reserves of coal and gas. As we transition to a low carbon economy, we go from bottom of the table to top of the table. And this is what Ross is saying is our enormous, enormous opportunity in this day. We have the best diversity of renew renewable generation resources in the world, not just Australia, here in South Australia. So when you look at the wind currents coming across the Australian Bight, we've got these beautiful diurnal wind currents that split up and down the Air Peninsula, that we have different wind hitting the coast at different times, great for constant renewable generation. So there's no um, you know, surprise that we've got nearly two gigawatts of wind generation in South Australia and bugger all elsewhere. You know, there's going to be more built elsewhere. Um, but you look at our solar, that's just our wind. You look at our solar, we've got amongst the best solar resource in the world. And we've got a real Goldilocks environment here. It's not too hot, not too cold. You might look at the Middle East and say it's great, it's you know, a lot of sun, but it's too hot. Solar panels optimally work the best at 25 degrees Celsius. So that nice sort of 10 degree split either way is perfect. We have that here. Yes, Queensland's got great sun. Northern New South Wales has got great sun, but they haven't got the wind. They haven't got the tidal. They haven't got the other stuff that makes up a diverse generation resource. When you look at wave and tidal energy, we were having that conversation before. Um, one of Sanji Gupta's uh, energy companies that he's bought in the UK is Atlantis Resources. So biggest wave and tidal company in the world headed up by a South Australian guy called Tim Cornelius. Uh, they have already identified one of the best passages for tidal energy in the world is our backstairs passage between Kangaroo Island and the mainland. So may not surprise some of you, may surprise some of you, but we can uh, produce up to about 700 megawatts of power just through that one stretch of water. Now that's half the state's average demand for energy. Um, you combine that with the wind, with the solar, um, we've got great geological landscapes for pumped hydro. We've just got everything here. So it's no surprise that um, 80 months or, or so ago, 